From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Clinical Reviews, interviews and ideas about innovations in medicine, science, and clinical practice. Here's your host. Hello, I'm Dr. Linda Brubaker, JAMA Associate Editor and a clinical professor at the University of California, San Diego, Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences. Today, we're going to be talking about a viewpoint mitigating the long-term health risks of adverse pregnancy outcomes, otherwise abbreviated as APO. We're joined by three experts from three different disciplines who focus this viewpoint on improving long-term health for people who have adverse pregnancy outcomes. I'd like our three authors to introduce themselves. First, Dr. Lin Yi. My name is Lynn Yi. I am a maternal fetal medicine physician at Northwestern University. We see pregnancy and the postpartum period as a critical window of opportunity to intervene and improve health for the long term. We're also joined by Dr. Eliza Miller. I am an assistant professor of neurology in the Division of Stroke and Cerebrovascular Disease at Columbia University. I got involved in this work because I was seeing a lot of patients who were in their 40s and 50s coming in with stroke and having really significant cerebrovascular disease at an early age. And looking back in their histories, I could see that they had recurrent adverse pregnancy outcomes earlier in life, like in their 20s. And so I got very interested in this topic and in how we can prevent this type of early disability from stroke if we could start a little bit earlier and catch these people earlier in life. Thank you. And our third author, Dr. Philip Greenland, is also joining us. I'm a professor of preventive medicine and internal medicine at Northwestern University. I'm a cardiologist and cardiovascular epidemiologist. And this topic is one that I became interested in when I started participating in a research project that was looking at the early consequences of adverse pregnancy outcomes and some of the subsequent consequences after the pregnancy in individuals who had adverse pregnancy outcomes. And the more I learned about it, the more I realized that there was literature related to the long-term consequences and very little was really known about the intermediate steps between the pregnancy and the eventual cardiovascular consequences. There's both an important clinical message here and important research opportunity. So the viewpoint highlighted that there are major knowledge gaps among the general public as well as healthcare professionals about the long-term risks associated with APOs. Dr. Yi, for this conversation, how would you define adverse pregnancy outcomes? What type of events are we talking about? Adverse pregnancy outcome is a term that includes many different pregnancy complications. In this particular context, we are referring to pregnancy complications with long-term cardiometabolic related adverse outcomes. And these include hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, which is a term that includes gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia, and HELP syndrome, as well as gestational diabetes, which is a form of glucose intolerance acquired during pregnancy, preterm birth, and fetal growth restriction. And the viewpoint also makes the point that it's about one out of five individuals who have one or more APOs, and there is a racial and ethnic disparity noted in this rate. Dr. Yi, could you comment on that? Adverse pregnancy outcomes are incredibly common, which really highlights why we as clinical and research professionals need to be working on this area of health promotion. Gestational diabetes and preeclampsia and hypertensive disorders in pregnancy in particular are conditions that adversely affect people of color. Individuals who are Hispanic, Asian, and Black are more likely to experience all of these complications. In addition, preterm birth, which is incredibly more common among women who identify as Black, is an adverse pregnancy outcome with long-term implications for health. Dr. Miller, in your introduction, you commented on the concerns you have for people presenting prematurely with stroke or even stroke during pregnancy. And I think there's a relationship with preeclampsia. Could you comment on that? There's certainly a relationship with preeclampsia that's pretty well established. And there is a substantial body of literature now linking preeclampsia to future stroke. And stroke is a very common disease, especially in women as they age. But what I have seen is that after these adverse pregnancy outcomes, I'm seeing the strokes earlier in life. So it's not just that sometimes 
people who have preeclampsia, especially preeclampsia with very severe features, will have cerebrovascular complications at the time of the pregnancy or in the immediate postpartum period. So we certainly see that, including very devastating strokes like intracerebral hemorrhage. But also, as they get older, these individuals will develop cerebrovascular disease at what seems to be a much higher rate. So we're seeing people having strokes in middle age rather than in older age when we more commonly see stroke. Dr. Greenland, it sounds like there are societies that are beginning to make guidelines to help close this gap and improve clinical care for individuals affected with adverse pregnancy outcomes. I wonder if you could comment on that from the cardiology standpoint. It's really interesting that when heart disease in women started to become recognized, which I would say in the grand scheme of things really only started to occur about 20 years ago. So it's fairly recent that the general medical community started to wake up to the idea that cardiovascular disease was not just a problem of men, it was a problem of everyone. The early guidelines for cardiovascular disease tended to ignore adverse pregnancy outcomes as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And it's only been in the last 10 years, I would say, that the Heart Association guidelines, both from the United States and from the European Society of Cardiology, have started to recognize and call out adverse pregnancy outcomes as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It's becoming more common that preventive medicine specialists and cardiologists would know how to assess adverse pregnancy outcome events for an individual patient. Is that true? I think that what's happening and the justification or the rationale for our viewpoint was that even though the guidelines are starting to make note of adverse pregnancy outcomes as a risk factor, I would say that it's not commonly recognized. There are some surveys that have been done showing that both among the general public and among the medical community, and this is also true of the cardiology practice community, that it's still not widely recognized that adverse pregnancy outcomes are an important part of the medical history and part of the risk assessment process. One of the other things that makes it difficult is that the risk assessment algorithms that we use, like the pooled cohort equation, recognize adverse pregnancy outcomes as a risk-enhancing factor, but it's not part of the actual equation. I think that it's still coming under some degree of early learning about this. And when I've lectured about this at different grand rounds, I find that a lot of cardiologists, for example, still don't have any awareness of this problem. Dr. Yi, obstetricians are in the front row at the time of these adverse pregnancy outcomes. What role does the obstetrician have in making sure that individual's subsequent care recognizes this risk? I think this is such an incredibly important life stage and transitional period. And clinicians who provide obstetric and gynecologic care have a really unique opportunity to set the stage for lifelong health by recognizing the importance of adverse pregnancy outcomes. I think there's a couple things that we can do in helping with this transitional period. One is educating our patients about the condition that they had, providing information and education about the adverse pregnancy outcome, what it is and what it means for their lifelong health, and why it's important to transition to primary care or have an excellent source for other preventive health care beyond the pregnancy and postpartum period. I also think that as you said, with clinicians who are at the front row of this, we have a responsibility to communicate the health events that occurred and the provision of health care that happened during the obstetric setting. So for example, if we know that a patient has a primary care clinician, communicating to that clinician that the patient had a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy or had gestational diabetes and needs close follow-up after those conditions is a key part of the handoff after obstetric care. Many patients don't have such a primary care relationship. Sometimes the obstetrician gynecologist might even serve as that primary care provider. And in those cases, it would be important for the obstetrician gynecologist to recognize the importance of all of the screenings and preventive care that should be done for patients with adverse pregnancy outcomes or to help patients find a primary care clinician who can work on these issues. Dr. Miller, as a neurologist on our expert team today, what type of handoff would you expect to be transferred directly to a neurologist other than things that are very clearly neurology related, such as a stroke during pregnancy or in the postpartum period? What other types of events would you want to hear about early? 
I actually think it's very under-recognized in the neurology community how much of a risk factor this is. And people sometimes think of neurologists as mainly seeing older people, and certainly we do see a lot of older people, but we also see a lot of young people, for example, for migraine, which is an incredibly common diagnosis in people in their pregnancy-capable years. Knowing this history about the person that they've had this type of event happen to them, first of all, you have to know to ask about it. But knowing that they have that high-risk event in their past medical history makes me think, what else should I be looking for in this person? For example, if a person comes to the emergency room and is reporting transient neurological symptoms that maybe you might think, that's probably not really a TIA, it didn't quite fit, I'm not sure if it's a TIA, but then you get this history that they've had several episodes of preterm preeclampsia or they had preterm birth several times, that is a red flag to me. And that makes me take that symptom and maybe have a lower threshold to say, you know what, I think that really actually was a TIA. This person needs a complete workup for that. Or I might even need to put that person on secondary preventive medications. So it can really impact the way that I evaluate and treat a person knowing that history. But of course, if you don't know to ask it, then you won't know about it. Dr. Yi, one of the barriers is so many individuals who have given birth don't come back for their postpartum visits. How do we address this issue? This is indeed a huge problem. We know that up to 40% of postpartum individuals don't return for comprehensive postpartum care and that there are tremendous disparities in who receives high-quality postpartum care. People who have no insurance or publicly funded insurance, people who are racial or ethnic minorities or who are medically disadvantaged in other ways are even less likely to receive comprehensive postpartum care. And I think there are some important things that can be done to start to close that gap in the receipt of postpartum postpartum care. One is from a systems level, the provision of insurance throughout the postpartum first year, not just the first 60 days, is key to being able to ensure high quality receipt of early postpartum care and long term transitions of care. And many states, such as mine in Illinois, have already started to do that and expand Medicaid coverage to one year after giving birth. I think this is crucial. Second is providing care that acknowledges and works to ameliorate the effects of social determinants of health is an incredibly important part of supporting postpartum individuals. And by that, I mean acknowledging the difficulties in getting to medical care, staying engaged in medical care, understanding the rationale for healthcare recommendations are all important parts of ensuring that we achieve the healthiest possible state in the postpartum period. This may mean support for things like transportation, childcare, food resources, insurance coverage to avoid insurance churn, health literacy support, and some of those other social determinants are just incredibly important in this postpartum period. Dr. Greenland, one of the recommendations is to counsel all individuals with adverse pregnancy outcomes about the long-term risks and to be screening within three months postpartum and at least annually at primary care visits. Now, the three-month postpartum visit doesn't always happen. We've heard that. There's a move within obstetrics to do an earlier visit, say, at six weeks. But if you were going to teach obstetricians to do their postpartum visit for cardiovascular screening, how and when would they do that? What would they ask? What are the high-yield questions? And what would trigger referral to cardiology or preventive medicine specialist? First of all, I think that the postpartum visit, if it's done by an obstetrician, that's great. If it's not done by an obstetrician, if it's done by a family physician or an internal medicine doctor, that's also great. What we typically recommend in terms of assessment of cardiovascular risk factors is some of the usual things that we always hear about, smoking history, physical activity history, family history of cardiovascular disease or hypertension or diabetes. Also important to be looking at body weight and considering has there been weight gain during pregnancy and is it important for that individual to be thinking about trying to develop strategies for losing some of the weight that they may have gained during pregnancy. Lipid profile is also relevant and by three months postpartum should be back to a baseline state. And if appropriate, diabetes screening, but certainly if the doctor or the clinician who's involved, that stage is not the obstetrician who took care of the patient. As we've been talking about all along here, it's critically important to review the pregnancy history 
and understand whether there was an adverse pregnancy outcome. Finally, I think it's also particularly relevant that by several months after the pregnancy has ended, blood pressure should have totally returned to a baseline state. And if the blood pressure is at all elevated early in the postpartum period, this is really a red flag that there's something going on that needs to be followed very, very carefully. I think those are really important points, especially now that there's growing evidence that fewer individuals are entering pregnancy in robust cardiovascular health. There's a higher risk overall. And Dr. Yi, I have a specific question for you. For an individual who had an APO during the first pregnancy, was lost to postpartum care and presents now with a second pregnancy, is there anything that you will do during the pregnancy to reinforce that the patient has long-term health risks now? We do see this circumstance every day, so I'm glad you brought this up. Many people don't get sufficient care between pregnancies, which is another reason why pregnancy is such an important window of opportunity. I think of our actions in the circumstance as kind of being two parts. One would be about education and knowledge in order to help the patient understand long-term health risks and understand ways in which to mitigate those health risks. For example, although we don't want a patient to lose weight during pregnancy, if weight is a major issue related to a particular cardiometabolic circumstance, we would use pregnancy as a time to start engaging in healthy behaviors, perhaps meeting with a registered dietitian or engaging in an exercise program to set the stage for weight loss postpartum. In addition, we think of this as a time period to help prevent adverse pregnancy outcomes in the subsequent pregnancy. So for example, a patient who had gestational diabetes in a prior pregnancy and comes in with a new pregnancy in which perhaps there has been interval weight gain between pregnancies, we would consider screening for type 2 diabetes upon initiation of prenatal care, potentially undertaking a different regimen of dietary counseling and therapy or exercise recommendations depending on those results, and maybe even would diagnose gestational diabetes in an earlier stage. For a patient who had prior preeclampsia, we would initiate on low-dose aspirin for prevention of preeclampsia preeclampsia in this pregnancy and discuss the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia so that preeclampsia is recognized at the earliest possible opportunities. So not only are we thinking about the pregnancy now and trying to prevent recurrent APOs, but also trying to set the stage so that the patient is healthy even when this repeat pregnancy is done. Dr. Miller, could you talk with us a little bit about concerns about hypertension that's going untreated in these individuals? This issue is really important to me because blood pressure is the single most important modifiable risk factor for stroke prevention. So I see a lot of women coming to me with neurological issues, whether it's headache or another issue, and it could be in the outpatient or in the emergency setting, and their blood pressure will be like in the 180s systolic, and they say, oh no, that's normal for me. Oh, it's always been that way ever since I was pregnant. And I say, okay, that's not normal. Even if you're stressed right now, it shouldn't ever be that high. And I think there's a reluctance to actually diagnose hypertension in a young person like that and think, okay, maybe they're just anxious or maybe it's what is known as white hypertension. But I think it's usually not, actually, especially when it's that high. And many times people are just going undiagnosed, untreated for years and years. And so it's really no surprise that then we see strokes in middle age. Dr. Yi, could you give us some guidance on the growing concern about rising maternal mortality? In the United States, we are faced with a dire problem related to growing rates of maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity. And I want to emphasize that this postpartum period and recognition of the long-term sequelae of adverse pregnancy outcomes goes hand in hand with our efforts to reduce maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity. And that we as clinicians should think about the importance of primary and secondary prevention of long-term morbidity as equally important to prevention of short-term morbidity and mortality during pregnancy. And to follow up on that, it also seems to be an important aspect of helping close the maternal morbidity and mortality gaps that we see by race and ethnicity. Definitely. We know that people from marginalized and minoritized communities experience maternal morbidity and mortality at higher rates and are disproportionately likely to die during and after pregnancy. So providing care and developing interventions that aim to close those equity gaps should be our highest priority for all of us. Dr. Lin Yi, 
Dr. Eliza Miller, and Dr. Philip Greenland. I want to thank all of you for contributing valuable insights from your area of expertise around a really pressing, prevalent issue that affects the long-term health of so many individuals. This episode was produced by Shelley Steffens at the JAMA Network. The audio team here also includes Daniel Morrow, Jesse McQuarters, Lisa Hardin, Audrey Foreman, and Marilyn Furkaluk. Dr. Robert Golub is the JAMA Executive Deputy Editor. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. Thanks for listening.